I got your message on your way to out somewhere. I was talking to Mark. I was talking to Mark. And then I had to hide. Well, good afternoon, everybody. Thanks for coming. Um, this is a 90-minute session about the question of open source procurement for law.gov. Um, as many of you may know, law.gov is an effort to establish a principle that the primary legal materials of the United States should be broadly available, um, should be available in bulk, and should be authenticated. Um, and there's been a series of workshops around the country uh, starting at Stanford Law School in uh, January. Uh, we've done 11 workshops so far at many of the major law schools around the country. Uh, most of those workshops have been legally oriented. They've been issues of intellectual property restrictions on primary legal materials or privacy protection in our courts, um, even financial issues. And our hope today is to look at another question, which is what if this requirement were in place and every city were required to publish their municipal code in a clueful fashion? Um, what would that take? And more importantly, could there be a reference implementation built on open source software that was available for vendors to perhaps enhance and then support, or even for a city to download and use? Um, in the internet world, when you make a standard for electronic mail in the Internet Engineering <coughs> Task Force, you don't simply put a proposal out that says all electronic mail shall be as such, um, because you get laughed out of the IETF when you do that. Um, and what you do instead is you have a reference implementation along with your standard, and that proves that your, your standard actually works. Um, and before you can become an actual proposed standard, you actually have to have two interoperable implementations that were done independently and they have to talk to each other properly. And so we're kind of here to discuss that very general principle of could open so source software be available for the publication of legal materials. And think of it as a content management system for legal. And you know the exact requirements of what that means, I wouldn't worry about. Uh, we had a two-day workshop at Cornell with many of the, the leading lights of the, tech, of the legal technical <coughs> world that looked at issues of you know what is the XML format and what metadata should be required and how do you do authentication. And so we're going to kind of take a step back and um, our hope today is to look at a couple things. So we're going to start with um, Jim uh, Stogdale from Accenture, who is one of our <coughs> co-conveners, and he's going to talk in general principles about open source software and the government, can it be done. Um, we have asked John Scott to talk about how the Department of Defense talks about open source software and procurement. Um, Gunnar Hellickson from Red Hat is going to talk about the European Union and how it does open source software. Uh, Brian Bellendorf is going to talk about healthcare and open source software. He's been deeply involved in, in, in the HHS efforts, um, and there's been similar efforts in veterans. Um, and then we're going to have Vince Surf back clean up here and kind of um, talk about some of those general principles and open it up to be a more of a general discussion about what would this take. Um, we are filming this, and as we are many of our other workshops. Um, this is the first of what we hope to be a whole bunch of meetings about this general topic. Uh, these meetings might end up being in some governmental entity. We, we hope that at some point this goes over the wall and the government starts to take over this issue of how do we publish our own legal materials. Um, so Jim, I'm going to turn it over to you. Uh, sure. So um, you know, the, in terms of the question of open source and government, uh, that's a really, really broad conversation and I'm not intending to try to tackle all of it here. What, what I, what I was trying, going to try to do was just a few comments about describing a generic pattern that might apply to the kind of situation you described. So uh, the sort of situation you described is lots and lots of government entities that range in size from the large federal government entities down to local government entities. And uh, it's sort of describing it that way implies an adoption orientation to what, towards which you're trying to achieve, right? So you can't just sort of, as we all know, you can't sort of just sort of mandate and assume that everybody does it. Um, there's got to be a high orientation towards making whatever you do accessible and easily adoptable or readily adoptable. So in that context, I don't think it's just a conversation about open source, but I think it's broadly um, applicable to talk about open source in that. Um, but so a, a, a few things you've already you already mentioned, uh, Carl, about the, um, the approach to developing standards and how that's sort of kick off to anything you might do with this. I think just wanted to kind of comment that that is 
a fairly broad conversation itself, both the semantics you alluded to with what are the XML schemas or those kinds of things, it's sort of a um, you know, figuring out what the language is and all of that. And then there's um, certainly diving down from there into systems of center, system operability kinds of standards, the how will they actually connect systems together and get them talking to each other. I think those are actually potentially two separate conversations, potentially two separate standards and, uh, attempts, if you will. Um, but I, um, probably uh, different things than that. Um, uh, you already also mentioned uh, implementations, uh, reference implementations. Um, I attended a talk by Brian this morning where he talked about um, uh, production-ready reference implementations. I think that's a really important thing to add into something like this. If what you're trying to do is ensure that organizations can pick something up and run with it, having it be a production-ready implementation rather than a you know, an implementation that should demonstrate the standards but could never be performant or operate in any way um, uh, is, a, is a different thing. So certainly striving towards a production-ready implementation um, is, is appropriate. Uh, the other, um, um, then so <coughs> going from there into whether or not it should be open source and or why, and if it's a the or a them um, is, a, is another thing. I think, um, actually, I don't think we're talking about a single reference implementation necessarily. I think what we're talking about is building on top of things that already exist. And even as we do that, um, this notion of maybe a content management system for the law, that actually has enough components that we probably want to think about those in an ongoing way as separate pieces rather than as a monolith. Also that they can innovate uh, independently and kind of progress independently, um, and also to kind of maintain choice across that system as it progresses. Um, but if you think in terms of um, I'm developing these reference implementations, I want to do the, the, the motivation for doing them as open source in the context of thousands of entities that you ultimately hope will use this stuff, is the, basically the same commoditization strategy that happened with something like Apache um, back in kind of web server world. You're trying to make sure that um, uh, you know, it's as broadly adoptable as possible, both from a cost perspective and from all the other reasons why people care about open source, because um, look inside the code, et cetera. Uh, I think there's a, there's a, when we use the word open source, we sort of use it to mean a lot of things. It's a very new speak kind of word, right? We sort of taken this vocabulary and we brought it down to one, you know, one thing. Um, but there's actually, as we all know, there's product oriented open source, there's community oriented open source, et cetera. Um, I think this pattern, nobody, I don't think it really has this name, but I think the, the, an interesting way to think of this pattern is almost like a forkable joint venture. Um, you see this in banking, for example, with um, things like AMQ and AMQP, um, you know, where you get together and they say, we, we, we need a new transport protocol uh, for, uh, for financial information. We don't want to continue to pay vendors high prices for this stuff. So we'll get together as a bunch of banks. We won't do it the old way, which would have been a joint venture, because it's difficult to sort of sort out the legal stuff up front. So instead, we'll rely on forking to make it easy to, to create that kind of relationship. We'll do the standards first, then we'll build a reference implementation, and then lo and behold, a few years later, you actually have, I don't know, probably five viable competing implementations now of AMQ messaging system out there. Um, and they compete um, based on different kinds of performance metrics or different use cases, et cetera. And they've actually generated an ecosystem of businesses that make money on Wall Street delivering that stuff, as well as a services ecosystem around it. And I think that's a really nice model for sort of what you'd be trying to achieve here. Um, you want to kind of kickstart the development through these reference implementations of a almost a distribution, a distro of a system that looks like the kinds of things you want, um, but then allow people to build on top of that, to build businesses, et cetera. Because the tipping point often comes when the people that are selling to your end customers, the, the people generating legal um, briefs, et cetera, when the people selling to them are bringing with them the notion of using the stuff, that's sort of when the tipping point tends to come. So you have to think about that part of the ecosystem. Um, so with that, it, you know, you're, you're going to want to choose ecosystem-friendly licenses, licenses that will actually let people do that. Now, when we talked the other day briefly about this, one of the things we talked about was, is there a um, relationship between this open source story and an approach to how you leverage open source in this environment, um, to sort of all the talk that's going on about cloud computing as well. If you, we go back to the sort of level setting at the beginning, which is try to make this as adoptable as possible, as broadly as possible. Um, uh, creating an open source project that is software as a service friendly, uh, <coughs> multi-tenancy and things like that built in from the beginning, uh, has licenses appropriate to supporting that model, is actually really valuable because then when you develop your ecosystem or when your ecosystem of providers springs up around this, hopefully some of them will actually be cloud-like providers 
that leverage the software you're using. But by virtue of the fact that you've made it open source up front, you keep that um, you keep the potential for decoupling that value chain always available. So you always should be able to move both inside your firewall, back outside your firewall as your needs change, that sort of thing. Um, ultimately, you can start with external providers when you're small. You can coalesce around regional activities. You can move into larger providers. You can do things like that um, by sort of standardizing at the um, level that way. Um, but I think that sort of like, you know, at every step along the way, you want uh, the, the thing you're trying to create to be as approachable as possible and as, as readily adoptable as possible by the, those, in, those in activities. And certainly for a small, you know, municipality, a runtime provision cloud service that requires nothing from their IT department up front will be much more approachable than, uh, than you know, downloading source and compiling and doing things with it. I think yeah, that, 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 that's really really important remarks there. I just um, I think the one other comment I would make is that um, from the beginning, I think it's important to think about um, this as a process that will be forever in disequilibrium. Think about it as uh, incremental, not as an end state that you're <coughs> shooting for. So both the standards bodies, uh, you know, should start with the things that are most important up front, and then move from there, um, and the implementation. Um, should start with the simplest things that get the most buck, bang for the buck up front and move from there. Um, and that um, what you would hope to achieve as that incremental process was happening was not only um, an ongoing increase in the functionality available to the, to the users of the system, um, but sort of seeing the, um, the breadth and scope of the community developing and evolving as that happens as well. So. Well, that's great. I, I love these workshops because um, you just learn so much on these different topics. Um, so Department of Defense, I arguably, is the best at procurement because they do the most. So maybe you can <laughs> <laughs> oh, well, maybe, they do the, well, maybe they do the most. Those <laughs> yeah. Don't tell them the truth. Don't be very disappointed. <laughs> well, I think you know, if you look at the quality of the quantity line, <laughs> um, that's one great thing about DoD is it is, it is such a huge organization. You can find pretty much every example of how to do it and how not to do it um, um, out there. Um, you know, so, so I guess a little background about open source and DoD, um, you know, it's always been there from the, from the earliest days and everything else. I think that you know, it really got a lot of uh, play about what it was in 2003 when a um, you know, certain unknown entity tried to uh, push their memo in DoD CIO about uh, we need to get rid of this open source software in DoD. And people at DoD said literally, well, how much open source do we have? So they just went out and did a little survey, just you know, just an email survey, not really too scientific, just email it out, blast that came back, read a report, like, well, if you want to just destroy the entire defense department, then they get all of the source. And stop it. So then actually the memo turned into one of like, well, it's okay to use open source. Um, and so, you know, since then, um, you know, we've had a you know, Department of Navy memo come out and just make, make, make the clarification that open source software it meets the criteria of commercial software. Um, we had another memo come out last year that just basically said, you know, here is what open source software is, it's okay to use. You still have to go through the normal wickets to, to kind of use it. So I think we're, we're in the mode of, you know, letting people understand it's okay to use open source software and working it from the outside. So it's kind of like the, the first step of, of, of moving along with we're actually using it. Now we're in the part of like, well, how do you actually interact with an outside community? Um, you know, Apache Linux and actually push bugs out there. And, you know, with Red, Red Hat does a lot of that for, for, Linux, for, for the military in the United States. But for other other packages or more applications, you know, had, what are the rules and regulations around kind of interacting with outside communities that you're not paying? And so you still have so you're still so I think we're kind of getting to that that other mode. I mean, we're not we're nowhere near um, you know that point, but we're kind of at least the people who really want to do it at least now have some some good ammunition to kind of run around and say we can we can do this now. Um, I think at DoD the, the the cases where we've seen work best are, are a lot of people who want capability or need capability but just can't pay for pay can't pay for it because the existing capabilities the existing systems you might buy are just so expensive that they just don't have it in their budget. So usually what happens, uh, and especially with the younger generations coming up in the military and, and the civilians, they know how to build how to build software, or they're not intimidated by actually going out and building it themselves at home, bringing it in, um, especially some people in uniform. I mean, again, we talk about that since his friends at Red Hat have done great work in, in, uh, you know, in Iraq in terms of actually building systems out in the field because they had access to, to actually be able to, be able to get, inside the, get inside the source code. So I think you know, that's where we've seen a lot of it. I think also um, DD's been good at kind of you know, the outside, the inside. That's probably where the, the toughest model is in terms of you've got classification issues and, and I see as well. 
And the other thing is you also, you know, keep in mind that the intelligence community uses a lot of open source software that made a conscious decision about we're going to go down that route because we can see the source code. So they just, they kind of went down this, we have to, just period stuff, we have to go down that route. Um, yeah, I think that the next thing for the military is really how do you kind of develop and publish open source software. So for things that just doesn't exist out there in the marketplace, how do you actually build and run a community? So there's a bunch of experiments going on right now. There, there's Forge.mil, which is just got up on the inside to kind of start to run, you know, kind of like ITAR, restricted kind of source code. Um, yeah, and there have been a number of gov various government agencies, um, you know, just, just for example, the Department of Energy let allow their program managers to publish to create projects as open source code for the people who pay for, pay for them. So it's interesting, a lot of the source code that went into, that migrated over to NIH for um, like proteomics and you know, parallel computing came out of the DOE labs. Um, just basically the publishers open source, you know, and there's basically I think it's called the CA Big Project that's kind of just basically taken off. But a lot of the funding goes back to C funding that the DOE pumped out. So there's some really good language there that uh, I can send you um, about uh, Allowing the program managers to actually require the contractors to put it under an open source license and run as, as, as a community. Um, yeah, I think that the one the, the one thing that we we really push in DoD is you're getting the communities together first. Because um, I think a lot of people come to this as like, oh, here's a technology solution. We need to go off and do this beyond where the. In, in my mind, the first thing is you really have to get the people together who want or need something because they probably will certainly know more than you about that solution. They probably just it already exists out there. Um, and he, first of all, I'll tell you what's really important day one, not something else. You know, like Jim's point about, you know, find the low-hanging fruit, you know, just, you know, the military just having something as simple as a maybe unique contract identifier for per contract, it's great value. <laughs> just, just, you know, versus having an entire, you know, content management system for RFPs, just having that unique thing and then fixing the accounting system would be great. So I think finding those simple things that everybody really, really wants that you can like, lash together really quickly, you know, and get you towards that reference, reference implementation. Um, good. Um, I think from the, the government side of government funding source code development, you know, a lot of wickets to kind of go through in terms of getting, you actually did engage a vendor to build your system, actually putting in special language in the RFP about you will publish this as open source software code or as a community. And Brian can probably talk about that and the fun you can have. Um, because it's just, you, the, the idea about IP stewardship is just not in the federal culture. Um, it's just, it's, it's, there's lots of, um, you know, the government has limited, unlimited government use rights around things they build, but even the government don't understand how to do it. And the government who do understand how to do it have been in government for 30 years. And then they leave, they go work for a law firm. Or they've been there for 10 years, they go work for a law firm, and then they, they beat on the government and went to a, um, <laughs> and it's kind of a, a spy, I paid and went to a, a legal, seminar about protecting your IP and they walk through all the various ways that you can protect your IP and one thing is, you know, file a ton of, before you sign the contracts, file a ton of provisional patents. And you've got like 18 months to basically go through and add in whatever you want, copyright everything. Because eventually, if you put copyright on enough stuff, it becomes your whole whole thing. So, I think, um, just, you, you know, really, and that's kind of one of those first design patterns kind of things you really have to kind of take a look at it as kind of the upfront rules like, you know, Here's how we really want to treat our IP with the community. And I think that then you'll end up down the road of, it's kind of like staring at the sun, you want to stare at the sun, you want to kind of look at the corner of your eye about where you want to get to and get the community together first. So that, that's, I mean, the military is, I think, you know, there, there are good pockets in the military that are kind of going down the route of using a lot more open source. And a lot of it is because they, some of these groups just don't have a lot of the funds or that they need to, to, to build stuff. I think in, in this case, less money is actually better because of forces. Okay. Uh, uh, European Union. Yeah, sure. So the um, uh, so the European Union is um, uh, is actually about the same place where the U.S. government, the Office of Management and Budget, and where the DoD is. And said that commercial software, is, uh, open source software, is commercial software and should be evaluated on some on these things. Now, some member states uh, are a little bit ahead of the others, uh, maybe too far ahead, you know, asking for preferences for open source software and open standards. Um, that's a highly contentious issue, and I'm, I'm not sure if we actually want to address it here, but the, um, uh, interestingly, the Open Source Observatory and Repository, which is a kind of research organization inside the EU, uh, published a set of open source procurement guidelines, which 
Uh, it was uh, funny to read a 64-page document that sounded awfully similar to the DOD open source method. <laughs> uh, so, <laughs> um, uh, so good on the DOD for actually out, out running the EU. And, uh, they got in three pages, but it took the EU 64 pages. Um, <laughs> Uh, but the well, but you have an 850 page constitution. So. <laughs> wow. <laughs> um, and this was only in one language. So, uh, um, so I, I don't mean to knock on the EU. So the the the, the, um, the OSOR open source procurement guidelines were were very interesting. Um, uh, they start out very much as the DoD memo does, which says, uh, okay, yes, uh, open source software is the same as commercial software. You here as long as you have a set of requirements, you can evaluate them. Um, you can evaluate them equally. And then it spends the next 63 pages telling you how to engineer a procurement to ensure that open source software is used, um, which is pretty fascinating. Um, which, which the DoD does not have. But yeah, which the DoD did not get quite that far yet. Um, and so the, uh, so this is in an environment though, which uh, and they say this up front, 19% um, of the software uh, that the EU buys is commercial office software. 52% of it is custom developed. Um, or done by contract by someone else, um, and 24% of it is developed completely internally. Um, which, wow. you know, I don't know what the numbers are for the U.S. government, but I, I suspect that they are. It's almost uh, inside out. I mean, the government actually has a. Well, first of all, it has a depends on how you measure. Well, it has an express measure. preference for commercial off-the-shelf software, right? Yes. Um, and I would hope that more than 20% of the software used by the federal government in terms of buy, dollars spent, you know, the government will buy a lot of closed-source software and then pay 500 bucks an hour to change it. Well, okay, this is so, also, you know, so what, when does yeah. it become? Well, in any case, the only reason why I mentioned the statistics is because it this seems, uh, they, mentioned, they themselves mentioned the statistics because this is an acute problem for them. Like they, they, they are looking for a way to um, both encourage more commercial off the shelf software and also figure out a way to not be saddled with the maintenance headache of the software that they've paid to develop or have developed in house. Um, so uh, so they, they mentioned the, the usual benefits that we've already talked about, the cost, um, the transparency, and, the, and one interesting point that they spent a great deal of time on is the sustainability of open source software. Um, and this was due to a few attributes that are unique to open source software. First is the transparency, um, uh, which is an argument I think we're all relatively familiar with. Um, the second was the interoperability. They actually make the claim that open source software is more likely to be interoperable than a proprietary uh, solution. Um, which is another argument I think that we're all relatively familiar with. Um, there was also this, uh, the characteristic of, of independence of open source software, that is uh, my ability to actually tender out the maintenance of a piece of software to multiple vendors um, and not be uh, inadvertently locked into a single vendor just because they happen to be the guys who have wrote it in the first place. Um, uh, the chances that I could get a marketplace or an ecosystem of vendors to support software is much better chance of doing that if the code is in fact open source. Um, and finally, the flexibility. Um, they are uh, they are more likely to be able to um, have software that responds to their needs if they themselves can change it or if they can find literally anyone to, to change it on their behalf. Um, so the sustainability argument was interesting and not an angle that I heard really elaborated on in the DOD memo or, or anywhere else in the U.S. government. We tried that. Um, we did try that. We did, we did try to have it in there. But <laughs> <laughs> well, and I think, the, 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 and I think for the DOD, the, the model is much more around the agility of what you can do what you have to source. Mm -hmm. All the benefits of terms of just being able to respond and build new systems which are not be locked in. That, that's the real value because we have enough money. So. Yeah. Um, and so the, the, the rest of the memo discusses, uh, their argument is framed around the fact that uh, we have rules on the books that say that you're not allowed to mention a specific vendor when you issue a tender. All right? um, I'm not allowed to say that I need uh, uh, Symantec software. I'm not allowed to say I need Microsoft software. I'm not even allowed to say I need hardware that is Intel or equivalent. Um, I can't even get that specific. Um, there's a very narrow set of rules around around when you are allowed to mention a vendor uh, specifically, and instead, it's better to describe a set of requirements and then allow the market to figure out how to fulfill those requirements. The process we're all very familiar with, um, and also very familiar with how this gets gamed, which is why it's interesting to have 60 pages of 64 pages of this document tell you how to game it for our software. Um, so, uh, and the, the authors actually say, uh, say here, uh, there is no obligation on the part of a public body to adapt its requirements to the business models of particular firms. Which that was like rather strong language for the, uh, for coming out of the EU. Um, but in any case, yeah, uh, so, uh, so they talk about three specific requirements that you can include in a procurement that would compel the respondent to include open source software as part of the solution. And the, the first is uh, having a transparency requirement. Um, 
Uh, open voting is probably the best example of this, right? If the government is going to procure a voting system, it wants to have some assurance that it knows how that voting system works. Um, otherwise, otherwise uh, it is simply not as good a voting system as, uh, as it would get otherwise. Uh, another requirement is uh, for redistribution. Um, I want to be able to procure the software once and then be able to hand it out to other agencies um, once, I've, once I've solved the problem. Um, uh, or, for that matter, distribute it to the public once I've solved the problem. Um, the, uh, the third requirement that you can include in a tender is the ability to alter source code. Um, and you can do this for uh, avoiding better lock-in, um, uh, for encouraging uh, new markets around a particular piece of software. Um, so if the government is doing something particularly cutting edge, it wants the ability to allow uh, many vendors to pop up around this particular problem space. And so uh, you can actually include that as, as part of your procurement that, that, that this would require. Um, uh, then they discuss uh, the importance of standards, and Jim, Jim and, and, and John both touched on this. Um, and uh, they talk about the, the, the tricky, everyone agrees on standards, everyone agrees that open standards are good. Of course, no one can exactly define open standards, and as we've seen on the European Interoperability Framework, it is, it is in fact impossible to define what an open standard might be. Um, and so the, the authors suggest instead, let's focus, as we did on the open source software itself, focus on the, uh, uh, focus on the characteristics of an open standard. Um, so I would I'm going to procure something which implements a standard which is transparently open. Um, I'm going to I need software that implements a standard which uh, is uh, available uh, with no royalties, et cetera, et cetera. And so, in kind of engineering uh, and describing the attributes of the thing that you want, rather than saying explicitly I need this to implement open standards or I need this to implement open source software. Um, you can actually guarantee, that you, first of all, you are improving the procurement software process itself because you are, in fact, following the rules. So this is what you actually should be doing in the first place. Um, and second of all, you're creating a level playing field on which open source software uh, can compete. Um, yeah, so I think I'll, I'll leave it there. Okay. So, yeah, so as I, I, actually, I, I will summarize by saying that um, it was interesting to see uh, that the European Union would um, and obviously there's a diversity of opinions in that large body, but, um, but to actually have a document that comprehensive, um, and, and it does all but uh, recommend open source software for most software projects. Um, and clearly they have, they are encouraging, especially for government use and most especially for uh, purpose-built government software uh, that it be run as, as open source projects. Okay, well, great, thanks. Uh, Brian, uh, your experience uh, not only in healthcare today, but certainly in the Apache Foundation seems somewhat relevant to this uh, discussion. So. Sure, well, I, you know, I thought I would start by talking about uh, the project that I'm particularly focusing on, but also talk about its history long before I showed up, because uh, this is a project uh, that's a, uh, uh, within the federal government uh, called the Nationwide Health Information Network. Um, it was actually started under the Bush administration. It started in 2005 when uh, the administration said, we want to create uh, a network for the exchange of healthcare records to provide, uh, of many benefits, provide every citizen of the United States with a personal healthcare record, a digital healthcare record, by 2015, right? Their first uh, focus on this was to, well, they created a, what's called the Office of National Coordinator for Health IT within HHS. Uh, and through the OMB eGov process, uh, went and interfaced with the VA and the DOD and the 28 odd federal agencies that have either possess health data or have a need to see health data, and said, let's let's focus on solving the internal exchange problem. For <coughs> Some agencies, such as the VA, have had a terrific digital health data system for a long time. Other agencies, uh, like Social Security, uh, uh, all of their processes were based around phone calls and faxes, uh, because when a, somebody applies for disability to the Social Security Administration, uh, it takes on order four to six months uh, to, for the to fulfill that. In some cases, over a year for a determination to be made because it involves going to clinics, going to hospitals, and asking for data, right? Uh, so there's a perception that there's a, a big problem here. And, and uh, they sat down and tried to say, well, what are the existing standards in this space? And there were terrific standards for data formats, uh, HL7 and CDBQ and, and other digital systems that were just starting to be used. But the way I characterize it is imagine if we spent the first 20 years of the web debating HTML versus PDF, and we forgot to do the URL. Uh, and, you know, we said, oh, we'll hand around these HTML files on USB sticks or something. Like that. Uh, so uh, the realization was we need to talk about services, right? And, and um, you know, for better or worse, they pick soap, 
right, as a platform for building uh, network-based services that were really about saying, okay, if I've got the DOD and I've got VA and I've got these soldiers who are going from their entering service, they get injured on the battlefield, they get treatment, perhaps at a hospital in a different branch, right? They come back and then they enter the VA system, right? Right. That that has them crossing over the boundaries of quite a few health IT systems. And that's what helped them crystallize uh, actually movement towards this was talking about the virtual lifetime electronic record for the soldier, and, and that, that finally created the use case. In fact, uh, at, at a year ago we had a conference um, around to run this project and, and had a living example of such a soldier whose spouse had become his living healthcare record because she was the one who carried the boxes of paper records to from doctor to doctor meeting and sent her as the doctor would prescribe you know, treatment X, uh, and, and she'd say, well, you know, uh, maybe not, right? Uh, this other doctor said something else. Or when a, when a medicine would be prescribed, she'd have to say, no, he was actually prescribed that six months ago. Because the new doctor's not gonna look through all this, right? So, tremendous opportunity here to save money, to improve the quality of healthcare. Uh, Peter Orzag at OMB believes that if we, we, we get to this system where this becomes na natural, that we could cut 30% off the cost of healthcare in the United States, <coughs> we combine it with comparative effectiveness, so all these benefits. Right? So they started this project, they started coming up with these standards, right, and said to test it, let's, let's actually build, you know, some pilots, right? So they took a big pile of money and funded 10 separate implementations of the first round of these standards, right? As part of it, part of it was, well, we've got 10 different organizations that have different IT systems, of course they're gonna all look different, right? And, and, and they went, they went forward and built it, demonstrated that, okay, there was some value to this, but the cost of maintaining those platforms going forward was seen as prohibitive, right? The cost of actually maintaining these independent implementations in different languages, well, that was seen as, as a failure of that process. So they step, took a step back and said, what's a better way to do this? And they realized that architecturally, all they really needed to build was a common gateway, right? That the VA could wire into VISTA, right, to their VISTA systems, that SSA could wire into theirs, that other agencies could wire into the private systems. And if we just built, you know, one body of code that talked on one end to the public standards and discovered other servers and could exchange these data, it could be like what Apache was, where it was a real simple gateway to back-end services that could all be different, but it's standardized and harmonized that on the way out over the pipe. Um, they also said, you know, we can't just look at the federal use case. We have to look here at um, building this uh, in, in conjunction with the private sector. Because A, our needs are not unique. B, a, an organic agency like the VA spends 70% of its healthcare money in the private sector, right? Um, uh, but the pro and the real problem in terms of cost savings and lack of adoption of electronic healthcare records is with the small clinics. It's not with the Kaisers. They do a great job. It's with the four person, four doctor operation in rural Kansas uh, or, rural, or downtown San Francisco. In my case, you know, who never saw the financial uh, incentive to actually move to a digital system for patient records. Many of them have for for the billing, right? Because many of the billers said you got to use a digital system, uh, but uh, never saw the incentive to do that for patient records. Okay, so the framing for this NHIN project moved from one that was purely about standards where the audience was the federal sector to something of more that was a combination of standards and software for which the federal partners were the primary customers, but which now there was a greater incentive to, to socialize this with the public, uh, to with the private sector get them involved. Um, but how do you scale that up? And uh, in 2009, they made the decision in kind of springtime to open source the platform, right? And I think they, they realized, this is just before I joined, I think they realized this wasn't good magic pixie dust, right? That, that would automatically establish it as, a, as you know, the universal platform. Um, but that, I, I, at the very, you know, very least putting it out in code was the first step in doing that. Uh, I joined after uh, I, I spent some time at the, at the White House working on the Open Government Project, and uh, Anish Chopra pointed me at this. He asked, what do I know about health IT? And I said, well, I went 10 years without talking to a doctor. Uh, so, uh, and the doctor that I have, you know, does not have an email address, because he doesn't want to hear from his patients, right? Uh, and so I assume it's all like that. He's like, yeah, it's all pretty sad. Um, so uh, uh, I dove in and, and spent the first six months every day, you know, learning a new acronym, learning a new standard body, learning a new, you know, constraint, but uh, uh, discovered that here was a project that was just at that, that on that cusp, right? Um, they had just released the code, and now it was, it was time to build a community around that code base, and the real question was, how do we do this phase change? A phase change from a project 
largely built by contractors, right? Because uh, FHA, uh, the Federal Health Architecture, which is within Office of National Coordinator, has a little bit of staff, but most of what they did was collect requirements from the federal partners, um, uh, and then boil that down into code to write, right, in the form of deliverable time and materials contracts. Uh, to some great vendors, by the way, some really good vendors, uh, uh, but drove a really agile process, released every quarter, right? Um, but where they saw their primary customer as uh, as the federal partners. I felt that um, rather than force them to put something into a nonprofit or bootstrap it as, a, as an Apache incubator project or something, that the I, I felt that there would be a gradual way to, to do this phase change, right? Which would be about um, uh, opening up their development processes. So we took the subversion repository they were using, made that publicly accessible, took the uh, issue tracker they were using, the JIRA instance, uh, and, and there's still some process planning tools that are tied into how they build the federal sector that can't be made public because it's, it's data about who's working on what for how many hours, right? Uh, uh, but um, uh, most of these systems, most of the processes involved in actually writing the software have been moved to the public. And, and we've done this largely because the, uh, the, the chief architect of the, of the uh, project, actually now project lead, Dave Riley, uh, wrote into the contract the ability to basically make this an indefinite deliverable, indefinite timeline, I forget what the term is. IDIQ. IDIQ. Um, uh, so he can basically create new requirements all the time and, and as long as he's signing checks for the contractors, right, it, it works, right? But that's that kind of agility, I think, is essential. To, I mean, it's how open source communities tend to work is by, by really focusing on, 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 a, on a more agile, you know, priorities driven you know, kind of thing. So FHA is still playing this role of bringing the agencies into a production uh, situation. Um, I, they're, with the new leadership at ONC, with, with a bunch of the contracting work, there has been I, 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 you know, funding on a continued basis, but, but not the uh, kind of reboot of the whole process that we've been needing for a little while. Um, so you know, I'm hesitant to point to it as, as, a, as a model just yet. Um, on the public facing side, we've been more successful. By putting this code out there, by recognizing that we can engage even the uh, federal partners in a public process, uh, you know, where, where the, the, the guy, the VA, who's integrating this in can be asking questions <coughs> that otherwise might be happening on a phone call or a private email. Ask it in public. It doesn't involve confidential data. If it does, then yeah, take it private. But if it's about how is this code supposed to work, when, and we answer that question in the public, it creates this public base of, of knowledge, this Q&A back and forth that makes it easier to scale up and bring new parties in. We now have, I think the number is about 12 different vendors who are building products and services on top of Connect. Um, we have uh, uh, five, sorry, four core contributors now, uh, outside contributors to the Connect base. And the, these are uh, 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 you know, in the Apache parlance, you know, committers, right? Um, uh, on the project who uh, we see as peers in the process. Um, uh, and uh, um, we have not, it's equal, even though the project originally started as kind of an integration of big systems, we have examples of small companies that have gone and, and delivered this as a product, as a solution to the needs of small regional healthcare information exchange needs. There's a, um, an, a what's called a, an HIO, a health information organization called uh, Redwood MedNet, um, based in rural Northern California, um, Mendocino County and, and Sonoma County, um, who built basically a network to get small health clinics, uh, both with an EHR as well as sharing data locally. Most health data exchange is local. Somebody's seeing a specialist going to a hospital in their local area. Um, and they built this in partnership with a startup <coughs> company called Mirth, who had their own open source plat platform, which is kind of a master patient index. You plug that together with Connect and you essentially you have LDAP plus uh, 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 Postfix, right? You know, <laughs> uh, and is to, to to use the SMTP kind of comparison. Um, uh, and they put the you know a solution like this in a small little one U rack server, right? Go out and sold a hundred at a time, right? And and now you have instant uh, healthcare messaging, right? And, and healthcare search. And so it's it's that's for me a success, right? They didn't need any federal funding to do that. They didn't need any over oversight by us. They didn't need to sign an agreement with the federal uh, sector. Um, and that, to me, is an example, success, a successful example of scale. Um, coming to think about, about what we have learned that might apply to law.gov, I would say, um, you know, obviously there's the federal case of let's build a single repository, but let's also look at 
you know, who was it, De Tocqueville called uh, uh, states the laboratories of democracy, and I think <laughs> cities are even more so, right? Um, uh, I think, you know, we see Toronto, we see DC, we see, uh, uh, to some degree, San Francisco and New York uh, edging to push the envelope. If we can, uh, when it comes to data.gov equivalents, right, uh, uh, even more so going faster and doing more creative stuff than even the data.gov at the federal level, I think, you know, just as with their uh, a law.gov solution, uh, I would sooner get look to uh, getting this funded by a consortium of cities or a consortium of states and saying, you know, <coughs> what kind of situation we've got peers, right? Peers who all have a common need, right? We were lucky with Connect, uh, with the healthcare project, the NHIN, that those 28 different federal agencies all essentially had the same need, right? If you're building an air traffic control software for one company, though, they're not immediately going to realize, oh, I should partner with the other airports that need the same software or, or whatever, right? Um, whereas states naturally, especially in an era of declining budgets, are going to naturally want to see how can I uh, cost share with other parties who have the same needs. So that's the first thing. And the second thing is finding a neutral ground to be able to have a conversation, to bring them together and say, let's let's have uh, the provenance of this project take place here, right? Or, or the uh, I, I don't want to say governance because that starts to introduce a whole lot of issues. It's simply, here's the neutral ground where we can build this. Whether it's Google code and and you know a, a simple wiki, uh, uh, or it's under the auspices of a nonprofit or an NGO that simply acts as kind of an oversight. And, and one thing the Apache Software Foundation does is provide a legal framework for collaboration. Um, Contributors sign a contributor license agreement, and that way anybody downloading code from Apache knows that this isn't code that just showed up in a repository one day. This is actually uh, uh, had a, 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 a chain of signatures back to the original developer so that I know that this license I see on it is actually trustable, right? Um, likewise, an, an NGO or, or, I mean, even an Apache incubator project could provide that same level of trust that as this thing has been built, I, I, you know, it, it's, it's, uh, it has a legal history. Um, I would also say be aggressive at building on top of what's come before. You know, even if that means picking, making a technology choice that that some people might throw their hands up and say, "No, you didn't pick my choice." Right? The Drupal community, for example. You know, Drupal has emerged as a real solid content management system with lots of add-on modules, uh, very well known now in the government space. Um, I would imagine ninety-five percent of what you would need to build for a log uh, has been built already. Right? Uh, and uh, that perhaps might be the thinnest sliver of work uh, to do, and, uh, uh, but you know there's other options out there. Um, and finding a way to collaboratively build that between between the parties might be the fastest way to get to a, a, a federal solution. Actually, so I, I have a question actually for Brian, <coughs> and actually this goes back to what Jim mentioned as well. Is um, in the governance of the project, um, things that, as you say, 28 peer states collaborating on something that's, that is that is different than having 28 peer states and then four vendors who stand to gain financially from the outcome of the project mm -hmm. contributing to. And so how do you manage, how does one manage, um, first of all, mission creep, uh, right? Because it's community people and anyone can add a, whatever they want. And so suddenly we've got, suddenly it's sending email and it's a web server and it's a, you know. Well, um, and, and then also like how do you prevent, in, in so doing, like how do you prevent also uh, accidentally locking yourself into a particular event. Yeah. Yeah, and how do we get it running on Android? Yeah. <laughs> right. Um, uh, so the answer to the first is that one thing we've struggled with within uh, FHA, which is Federal Health Architecture, the office within ONC, is um, uh, conceptualizing themselves as a pivot point in the way that Red Hat is a pivot point. Let me describe it this way. Red Hat has two communities that engages with it. You know, it has other, but let's say two buckets. It's uh, customers, you know, the financial services customers, the uh, uh, health care customers, basically people who pay Red Hat for a support relationship, who have things that they need to see in Red Hat products and are willing to pay to have evolved, right? Um, and, and that's part of their relationship with Red Hat. You have the expertise, and you can customer manage them, and all, all that kind of stuff, and they pay for that. Then there's another community uh, of the open source community. And it's the Linux kernel developers, it's the JBoss community, it's the, you know, all the different, it's, and you are this pivot point because requests are coming in, you're managing them, you know, and, and trying to say, well, no, that's really silly, or, or yeah, that makes sense, you know. For this the record, thing, we never say silly. So. Well, uh, 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 <laughs> <laughs> we'll get to that next quarter. <laughs> uh, 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 um, 
and, and basically you, you product manage, right? Yeah. You know, and, and um, but when there's a new piece of code that makes sense, you either advocate for it or, or file it as a patch or go ahead and commit it on, on the other side of that equation, right? right? FHA has struggled to figure out, it, you know, uh, a, you know, that they have to be in this pivot point, right? Because the question is how much of what happens over here should actually be happening over here, quite a bit of it. But then there's other things that shouldn't, you know? I mean, um, these federal agencies expect FHA to deliver on a deadline, right? Deliver to a, to their promises, right? Because they've got pilots that they're spinning up, they've got providers and, and, and other upstream things that they've got at times. So when uh, SSA wants to expand the work that they're doing with others, it's like they have to plan ahead for them, right? Um, and that's a promise that only a vendor can really make, right? Uh, I mean, you, know, you might uh, uh, be able to commit to delivering Red Hat branded code or something, but you can't commit Linus to, to, to something, right? Um, you can't. <laughs> <laughs> We're not that far. <laughs> Nobody's that far. There's, um, so right now, the, the relationship is a standard contracting relationship. And getting them to think that there's also this community-facing thing, that there are more, more than they're <coughs> talking about, right? If, if, that's that's the that's where the phase change might have more of a hard lift, right? It's actually an interesting like, twist too, I think, in sort of like how these models end up rolling out. So like in some of the DoD projects that we've seen that have been open source, for example, um, there have been some cases like there's a project that the Army runs called OneSAF, which is a simulation system, and they sort of set out internally to make it an open source thing. They wanted a community to build, develop around it. They wanted companies to use it, but they've explicitly built into their contracts. Cleanse. Cleanse. Yeah, cleansed and licensing to say, this is how you license it. These are activities we'll pay you to do, right? So we're going to pay you to run a, um, a repository. We're going to pay you to run community and do those things. Because if you forget to do that, it doesn't happen, right? Um, and so that's very much a part of the requirements for that program or to sort of do community and do that stuff. And then you have other cases where um, I mean, it's actually been vendors taking initiative to create open source where they recognize that there are serial projects that will have similar needs and they take it upon themselves to sort of be the product management of the, of the stuff. So for example, there's a, um, an open source project called Delta 3D which has created a gaming engine for doing um, you know, cockpit simulation and stuff like that. And what those guys have done is actually the, the corporate entity that said, nobody ever asked us to do this, but we're gonna create a distro of this stuff, put a bunch of stuff together. We'll pay out of our own corporate IR and uh, internal R&D dollars to manage the repository and manage the, ult you know, the ultimate uh, product development you know, priority list. Um, and then what we'll do is each time we get a contract where we're going to deliver the contract based on the stuff, we'll use some of the dollars or some of the overhead from those dollars to support this. It's worth pointing that out just to say that there's different models by which something like a law.gov kind of environment could play out. But if it is <coughs> government deciding to do it, one of the you know, your question ultimately was how do I get these these coordinating entities to, to, to agree on how to do this? You ultimately want to make sure that whatever contracts they write explicitly like ask for the things that are, are not automatic. You know, sort of the master <coughs> services agreement stuff that's going to say these are the licensing terms we want you to use. You know, we're, you're going to, we're going to pay you for to do a repository. We're going to pay you to do community activities. We're going to pay you to run a master product list, and this is how we're going to pay you to do governance around how it gets prioritized and all that kind of stuff. That if if you just sort of leave it to thin air, it doesn't happen. Well, the thing I was just about leaving the the what Brian's was really important and is that and this is one thing that we we struggled with in the military is they'd like to run things more open, but it's how do you run things open? If you look at the really successful open source projects, they have a really strong leadership team either leader or leadership team in terms of people who are like, here's what we're going to do. That's what, you know, even if I'm laid off, I'm gonna work on this at night. You know, if you, you sort of those people who have a passion, but in, gov in government, you end up with people who are like, they rotate into their jobs and, oh, I'll be here for three years. What about, what about do? Oh, healthcare, okay. I was doing missiles before. <laughs> <laughs> but you end up with that, especially with government funding, where if you are, which I think is why why Connect is so interesting and in what they're doing there is like, how do you kind of, Build that process and that system to where the people are somewhat inter interchangeable. You know, it's not just the, the code's interchangeable; the people have to be interchangeable as well. So, how do you kind of like lock them into a mode of contractually? I don't know, I hate saying the word bylaws because people want to read bylaws, but just you know, or, or mem memorandums of understanding amongst the 20 agencies, um, especially something like this where you're moving forward with something that could end up being multifaceted. You know, it might be services, it might be cloud, it might be actually downloaded code, production code. You know, how can't get the government to understand, yeah, you can run this and just, what, what is that? Yeah, no, 
know, governance is a bad word, but just kind of keep this thing rolling where the personalities don't really matter so much. I mean, like, uh, there's a great case of the Boeing and the system El Sasco, which um, was kind of trying to build like a basic operating system for the military. And uh, at some point, some girl came in and said, we're going to go Microsoft. He got all the Linux stuff, put all Microsoft stuff in. He was there for two years, and then, like, he left me. Now the guy came and said, like, okay, I don't know what that was all about. <laughs> <laughs> now we're going back to Linux, and that's all we're going to do. But, but, you know, but in that case, where somebody can just kind of come in and just change everything. So it's like, you, you know, you kind of want to have, you know, change, but change is good in terms of system moving on. And so I'm really interested to see, this is the toughest problem, pro this is the, that, that, that is the toughest nugget for things like, I mean, connect or something like this going forward is keeping that. Okay, so um, I think what we're going to do now is Vince going to say some a, a few words, and then I'd like to open up the discussion. I, a couple reminders: um, we are videotaping this, so if you're speaking, if if you can belly up to the table, simply because we don't have an incredibly wide um, camera, um, and if you speak for the first time, please introduce yourself um, so that we we know who you are. Uh, but Vince, if you can maybe summarize what we've wow. heard so far. Sure. Uh, you I'm, uh, uh, <laughs> I'm Vince Surf, and I'm Google's chief internet evangelist. Um, but I. I promise I'll try not to be, be too preachy today. Let me start out by making the observation that you began this meeting uh, with a kind of implicit uh, assumption that open source was a solution to a problem you thought you had. And, 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 and so I want to step away from that for just a moment uh, and only get there uh, by some kind of uh, syllogistic reason. Uh, the first thing I think we want is to get the laws in a form which they, which renders them easily accessible to everybody uh, at very, very little uh, cost to access. Uh, start with that. There may be a cost to get them into that position. So we, we all, I think, appreciate that. Uh, the implication that all the laws are somehow equally accessible says that they are going to have to be rendered in a form which um, makes them easily accessible, which suggests they have to be in some standardized form. And I want to use the, the word form in the plural for just a moment, not to be trapped into a specific choice for a moment. Uh, if there could be a few uh, forms that could be widely understood and interpreted, that might be adequate or okay, a single one might be okay, although um, I've just come away from a meeting uh, that talked about the bit rock problem, uh, which has to do with the fact that you store digital information away, which is only interpretable if you have application software that knows how to interpret that particular format of the data. And if that software <coughs> becomes uh, inaccessible or unavailable for some reason, then the bits are not useful and they become kind of rough. So um, standards are going to be really important here. Um, even in the absence of open source, the standards are, are going to be needed. So I think we have to start there. There has to be some agreement about that. Um, it's also clear that you want to make it as easy as possible for the sources of those laws to render them in this form. Um, and here, I'm not yet fully persuaded that open source is necessarily the solution to that. Uh, I can easily accept the theory that there are proprietary packages capable of rendering things in a form which makes them interoperable or easily accessible. Uh, one thing which is, however, an interesting question has to do with how to keep the cost of maintaining this growing body because it's clearly going to change over time. So laws get, new laws are enacted, old laws get discarded, they get revised and everything else. So there is this um, turmoil of uh, an evolutionary uh, <coughs> effect, which means that whatever, this is not a one-time thing. Uh, and we haven't even said anything about case law, which is interpreting these things, but that too probably has to be taken into account. Because even if you only have, a, if you only have access to um, the law as written, and you don't have access to the law as interpreted, then the information that you get may not be as useful to you, uh, and that could be quite misleading and uh, somehow misunderstood in the absence of 
understanding the case law. Too. Yeah, no, this is about primary legal materials on all three branches of government. So it's, it's the laws as compiled in the U.S. Code. It's the opinions as issued periodically. It's the Federal Register notifications as compiled in the Code of Federal Regulations. And that's what like the Torah, uh, Talmud, that's at the national level, and then we have our states, we have our county, okay. we have our okay. states. So you are including the, the case laws? Primary well. legal okay. materials uh, in the United States. Is yeah, considered prim okay, so yeah. good. So that means that we have a, and we're thinking it, not only very broadly, but we just made the problem harder for the good of, <laughs> <laughs> for the good of all mankind. Um, all right. So uh, I think that the, uh, the story. We're not limited by the possible. That's a t-shirt. Uh, so now, the, the capture of those laws uh, and the ability to get them uh, conveniently um, means that uh, somebody's going to have to store them away and make that accessible in an online way because we all know that we aren't going to go to each city in order to get copies of laws. The whole idea was not to have to do that. Uh, and there may be good reason for wanting to be able to reach uh, the laws and case law uh, on a widespread basis. So I may need to know what the laws are in you know, 17 different states on a particular matter uh, in order to render an opinion or to formulate uh, a plan or a policy. Um, this is where you get into a very interesting question. At, at Google, of course, we uh, build major systems to store a lot of information away with the intent that it be accessible to those who are uh, authorized to get that data. Uh, and in some cases, it's public data, just like the indexing of the, of the World Wide Web. So there may be uh, more than one way in which to get all that material housed. It doesn't have to be in one central repository. It can't be. It can't be. Um, in our system, it's going to have to be a distributed solution. So, now, there may be people that will aggregate it, commercial vendors such yeah, as LexisNexis yeah. and West or the Law Library of Congress, but the source production of these legal materials, by definition, is going to have to be a distributed system. I don't see the only reason it has to be aggregated by the government in one place. Right. And it would be very hard given the distributed nature of the government to do that. Anyway. Right. There, there are entities such as the Law Library of Congress that have a dream of being able to aggregate large but, amounts of information, but, but even they but understand would, they're not going to be comprehensive. But you wouldn't need that, right? I mean, right. If, if all of that, all of the primary law was publicly accessible, Google would make it searchable. If, uh, yes, although we, we, it's also very important that other than Google, that too. Yeah, yes. that this is, we, yeah. get, we get to this need to have an architecture that allows lots of um, opportunity for, let me use the word competing, but I, I'm really trying to say that multiple parties can provide the capability, multiple parties can hold the information as long as we can discover them. I think it's also relevant to say that absent the widespread use of URNs and the understanding of URNs today, URLs serve as that point of authority. Right, that to be able to say, like, if we're gonna, if it's if it's you know law dot say dc dot gov, you know, it's it's the law dot gov repository for the, the District of Columbia, right? And then there's some regular format to the mm -hmm. endpoints of that. That becomes a reference that mm -hmm. ends up in, you know, other legal opinions that want to cite prior legal opinions, right? That becomes the basis of the hypertext connecting, right. you know, uh, these things. And eventually, hopefully, we'll get the URNs, but but for now. Uh, URL space actually connotes some semantic meaningfulness. It, it does, and although I am a very strong believer that URLs are a very weak uh, stopping point because of the fact that they are not necessarily stable. Yeah. The, the sure. Cornell workshop, by the way, looked in depth at some of these issues, and for example, the URN Lex scheme coming out of Italy it shows great promise for legal material and has been adopted by a large number of entities. One could imagine the administrative Conference of the United States, for example, developing a URN LEX document ID mechanism, um, which might then get adopted by a number of law generating entities as a way of doing unique IDs inside of each of the documents. Separate, perhaps it's separate that should be building a Firefox module for resolving LEX. Right, and, and so a lot of this, as, as we've heard, is about, about standards development. 
Um, but then one of the issues is there are going to be a lot of entities producing um, court opinions, right? We have courts all over at different levels. And the question is, if we, if we have a general principle that says if you are a court, you should make your opinions available for bulk download and they should be authenticated. Right. So the, the basic principle is that you take each of the bodies who are issuing portions of the primary legal matter, right? Legislative, administrative, and and the courts mm -hmm. who are who are the, um, the who are issuing case law, and if each of them individually <coughs> publishes right a body of legal material, then other sources can advocate, right, or index, right, and that will take it, take care of itself yeah. in well, time. So uh, the, the important part here is that we have a set of standards that allow for this degree of flexibility and distribution. That's right. And, and we're not worrying about the downstream part as much as the initial production of those legal materials so that the downstream providers can do things. So we, we clearly have a big challenge, I think, to have this because we're going to have to identify what things need to be held in common, what standards need to be in place what practices need to be uh, in, instituted. And by, by uh, referring to um, authenticated uh, documents, things that whose integrity can be validated, we're implying a bunch of other uh, mechanisms that uh, we're going to have to uh, specify. Uh, to make matters even more complicated, whatever it is that uh, we choose will have to be acceptable and satisfactory to all parties. It's, uh, to use a very rough metaphor, uh, when we drive in states other than the ones that have issued our driver's licenses, there is a presumption among the states that you've been adequately uh, tested uh, to drive safely in, across the United States. Um, we, shouldn't take time to debate whether the, any of the tests are, are adequate or not, but we make the <coughs> presumption or it's not. <laughs> we, make, we make the presumption because uh, anything else wasn't implementable. So there are a set of presumptions that we will have to build in that either certificate issuances can be trusted or you know, the, the technology that we've chosen to uh, validate the documents is uh, strong enough so that it would be difficult to uh, modify the material and cause, cause problem. Um, so this is a systems design problem, in my point of view, even before we ever get to questions of open source. Uh, and so from, uh, there was an, an earlier comment about first we do the standard, <coughs> and then uh, we do the prototype and reference implementations, and then we try to get into something that's operational. And I'm sort of okay with that observation, but I have a great desire to try things out somehow, pilot some things, before I think it's safe to say everyone should do it this way. Uh, this is burning fingers from the internet experience. Most successful internet standards yeah. started with code and then became yeah. standards. Right. And it so became standards because there were two implementations out there and people well, decided they wanted to talk to well, each other. Some, sometimes, <laughs> although there, there are deliberate attempts <coughs> to figure out what should be held in common. Sure. Down to the basic internet center was exactly what should be held in common. It, it, it was ab initio. Uh, it wasn't trying to get SNA to talk to DECNET. It was recognizing that SNA and DECNET would never talk to each other except for the box and, you know, and, and squared implementations across stuff didn't work for the same reason that the, that the licenses are accepted. You couldn't do n squared tests to make sure that you could drive safely in every state you might show up in. So uh, there is work for standardization ahead of time, but there's also work for validating that the, what you chose to standardize actually makes sense and works and, and it scales up and, and everything else. So to come now to the open source question, um, it has advantages that have been outlined in some cases first. In theory, you can know what the software is. Now, this when, when you scrutinize that assertion, you can discover very quickly that you aren't necessarily sure because they can show you the source code and they can give you the object code. And what you don't know is whether the object code and the source code are, you know, and you can say, well, I will compile my own and there are a whole series of 
are you capable of doing that on a little three uh, three lawyer thing in a town over here? And, you know, I don't know what the word compile means. <coughs> so um, we need to be a little careful about glibly assuming you know equivalence. Um, I'm not trying to, to, to make this doomed uh, from the start by any means. I just wanted to be realistic about what assumptions we make. Um, so the open source also has to be maintained, and there has to be the source of it, which is why the Red Hat example is terribly important. Your the Apache example is terribly important. Because the fact that it's open doesn't mean that you or should accept uh, the next version from an arbitrary place because you might do everything that it's supposed to do and something else that they didn't tell you about and you don't have time to go look. So you need to have sources of open source that you trust to maintain that uh, filter the suggested updates and changes and modifications and everything else, which says that it isn't terribly different than uh, the kind of proprietary software that we used to use. Now, so, it, the, the mechanics and the dynamics and even some of the costs are not The difference here is that there is a, a possibility of someone else competing on the assumption that the open source is readily available. I think that's a key point, man. It's not necessarily that the entire stack is going to be an open source solution and everybody will be able to download it for free and use it. I think the question is whether the core requirements um, you know, for example, if, if one could use a Linux operating system and, and could use Apache and could use Bind for the DNS, and then a vendor could in fact build some authentication XML management on top. Um, the, the core issue though here is whether one could do this without issuing an RFP for a single vendor that might, just to use an example, specify Documentum and Oracle as the core data repositories and that all future uses of this software are hardwired to, again, just for an example, Oracle and Documentum um, as their use. And again, the key here is that we're going to have a lot of small jurisdictions, cities, counties, water districts, that are going to have to be able to issue these materials. And perhaps they're going to they're going to contract with a cloud-like vendor, right? A code management company that offers to cities to maintain their codes for them. Uh, but once again, we want to make sure that we haven't hardwired that into, for example, the Amazon cloud. Um, yeah, so I, th I think you just said so. So open source is maybe the wrong word. Lock-in is maybe the well, right word. Right. So, well, it's two, it's two specific problems, right? The first is uh, making the tools generally available to even even the poorest mm -hmm. jurisdiction. And then um, uh, and then the second is being able to compete, right? Which, which, which are actually two yeah. separate things. Right? Ecosystem actually, is I, a word I really like. I think there's a third, too, which is that so you, know, you said you want to avoid having to hire some big integrator or whatever to build this whole thing. And as you described the problem, for sort of a, a Bolt's law kind of thing, right, which says, I want to have a big system eventually, and I want it to have grown up evolu in an evolutionary way to meet all these needs. I can do that. One of the, one of the reasons why I'm advocating for open source for this is I think that it helps develop that from the ground up in short incremental cycles that eventually get you there. Whereas if you do go say, dear large company, I need you to build a system that ultimately will satisfy 7,000 you know, municipal entities and please go figure out the requirements for that. You just automatically create a situation you can't right. fulfill. And, and, I, and, I, and I like the option. I, I met the CTO of the city of Santa Rosa in California. Really good guy, really knows his stuff. And if he is required to put their municipal code online, he might RFP this out, right, and get software. But it would be nice if there were some version of a code management system available that was available. Um, and perhaps it's not the full feature version, but one that's available at minimal cost, if not free, and certainly it's unencumbered a, by, by, by it is, license it's requirements. A, it's an, it's um, uh, if nothing else, an open source implementation of the standards that we're talking about is an implementation of last resort. So, I mean, I think, frankly, if Oracle and Documentum and General Dynamics and Lockheed want to sell somebody something for $18 million, <coughs> that's great. Like, they, they may, in fact, do a great job. Um, and it's going to happen in places like California yeah, court system, yeah. for example. Now, now, here's the you know, interesting thing. The California court system has a system. Now, it's more than simply dissemination of data. It's also management of their data. But they're spending $3 billion dollars on building a software system for management of the California courts. Just, just have a question in terms of who. There are other people who have this problem. What are other countries doing with this? 
Can anybody actually build? I mean, Europeans, I mean, they, has anybody built maybe the, the structure or the framework of something like this already that's out there in the open source land? Uh, there is not a complete um, equivalent to WordPress for the legal publisher. Um, many other countries have done a much better job than we have in, in building um, open access to the law um, functions in, in Africa. If you look at the LII movement from Cornell, for example, they've helped lead that as kind of an international uh, revolution. Now that said, those jurisdictions are potentially much simpler than the case of the United States, where it's truly mind-boggling. I mean, we think DOD is, is complicated. <laughs> our judicial system, for example. Well, our lawyers, lawyers are everything, everything, so why wouldn't it be? <laughs> <laughs> uh, yeah, if, I could, if I could slip in, there's a list of at least three uh, you know, making tools available. Can you introduce all. yourself? For, oh, I'm sorry, for David, we, David A. Wheeler, uh, IDA. Uh, is making tools available to everyone, even those who can't afford, say, that $3 billion system. Uh, putting lock in and growing up in an evolutionary way. Now I'm at a fourth one, which is similar to the flexibility, uh, to the uh, growing in evolution work, and that's the whole, the whole flexibility, mm -hmm. uh, the ability to change to new environments. Mm -hmm. uh, and I, and I would completely agree it's related to the first one. You know, frankly, I think that's one of the big draws from the DOD world. Uh, from the DOD world, uh, you know, the adversary doesn't attack the same way they did last time necessarily. We need to be able to adjust we get new systems, we need them to be able to work with the old ones. If we can't change the software on A and we can't change the software on B, the only thing we can be sure of is it's gonna be really hard to put A and B together. Whereas when you control the software on ideally both sides, suddenly things like integration using new situations um, is, uh, it's, it's suddenly a rational economic thing you can do uh, as opposed to, ideally I could do it and I've had a billion dollars to spare, I could do that also. Um, and so in theory you can do that other ways, you know, I'll build a new box and translate everything in n squared ways, or, or other stupid approaches if you like, but it's a whole lot simpler to be able to say, I need this software to work with that software, I will change some of the software so they can actually work together. And I think that is an argument if you want, you know, to go down this path uh, for being able to do open source because it means that not only say that uh, I don't know, you're in charge of your central set, but that different folks can adjust things for you know, I'm, a, I'm a local municipality and I do things this way with this very usual legacy system and I now can integrate it into my system. I guess I throw in one more comment too. Like, so the, when I'm talking about uh, open source as a potential approach, I'm sort of implying, I guess I was implying without saying, that I'm assuming that the, the software that these government entities are paying to build be developed and licensed that way. It, you know, in a modular design, if there are components, like to your point, the things that are creating the documents in the first place or whatever, where there already is an answer, and it can be sort of boundary, you know, implemented into the into the overall system, and it already exists as a proprietary thing, and on an economic basis it makes sense to do that. Um, you know, it may be easier to take that off the shelf and do it. But if you're going to, if you are the state of California and you're going to spend three billion dollars developing, implementing, and, and operating the system, um, I think it, you know, it's in their best interest to do that in an open way, ultimately, because it'll give them more flexibility and all these other things. The, the, um, the, 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 the oh, sure, please, 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 please absolutely. First of all, I think you should let everybody else have yes, a say. Yes, absolutely. <laughs> <laughs> but, but I, I do want to overemphasize my fear. <laughs> it's the standardization which is critical here. The implementation question is, in some respects, secondary and important because of its enabling character. But without the right standardization and architecture, none of this stuff works. It doesn't you know, propagate, it doesn't evolve or anything else. So I would caution you to be very careful about over being overly specific <coughs> about the fact that this subject matter happens to be law. And the only reason I say that is that if you want something that generalizes, then you want to be a little careful about how special it is. That's why HTML, which wasn't specific to any particular expression of any particular information, turned out to be so important because that you could generalize. Lots of people could use it. There was a gigantic support platform because it wasn't specific to any one application. So I would say, while you're thinking through whatever gets standardized, be careful not to over uh, express the subject matter here. You know, let me, can I jump in here? Yes. I mean, Kane, I'm the chief architect for Lexus Nexus. I think you hit it on the, on the head there because just 
you know, we've got, just speaking from the kinds of things that we do from, you know, speaking as a vendor, and I'm not trying to save what we do, right? I mean, I think this whole industry has to evolve, but we've got some experience as to what sure. works and what doesn't work. Mm -hmm. and, um, you know, we've got case management software, and I know where the complexities are. They're not in developing case management software. They're in the fact that every single jurisdiction in every single state wants that $500 an hour consultant to do it slightly different, right? And it isn't that, you know, a single case management software would suit. So, you know, if, if you think about it from that approach, and it's generally the way I would think about it, it's what can you do from a central body that would create enough standardization that you still have the motivations of the individual jurisdictions at heart, but you get enough standardization that maybe, you know, market dynamics kick in, maybe, you know, you've got incentives. I mean, when I think about open source just, you know, as a commercial vendor, I don't force open source. There are times that doing open source is commercially good idea for me, right? And I've got projects that I do open source, and I've got projects where I have intellectual property, and I've got reasons for doing both, mm -hmm. right? I suspect the same would be true here, and I would go back to the the principles you, you talked about um, for Red Hat. There, if you go back to the attributes you're looking for, right, which is, you know, big sophisticated systems for big sophisticated states and nice cheap systems for jurisdictions that can't afford it, I suspect the answer will present itself. Right. right. Well, so, so I think that, you know, the, the one thing I always come back to is that with a lot of, you know, good technology eventually becomes a commodity. If you're really looking at how do you kind of push for law.gov, what, what, how do you kind of create that driving factor of like, okay, today I will pay for, you know, I will pay for this, but in three years maybe I'm not, or I'm paying much more. So how do you kind of you know, kick off that or ignite that commoditization of that market? Because we all have cars, and all we have Ferraris, but you know. But so how do you? But there are some states who will basically say, okay, well, you know, we, we know we'll do that. So how do you kind of kick off that commoditization? And I think open source is a great vector for kind of driving some of that. But in the day, you know, whether you, whether you would, if you could buy the same system at five dollars versus you know fifteen million dollars. You know, it doesn't matter whether it's open source or whatever, but you want you just want come on. Yeah, I think, I, I think the word open source is maybe the red herring, and I, I'm certainly responsible for that in, in making that the title of, of this session. <laughs> uh, but the, the issue is that we, we have a lot of, of common elements in publishing many of the elements of the law, and of course many differences um, in the jurisdictions, and the courts are absolutely famous for that. Each one has different local rules. Uh, but if you look at the process of, of producing annotated statutes, for example, uh, the question is, are, are there issues of standardization or reference implementations or encouragements of ecosystems, as we've seen in the healthcare world, that, that can help spread that on a national basis um, in a very complex system of lawmaking? Um, and, and the points of, of not getting overly specific on the law are vitally important. Um, the kinds of standards I think about are, you should use HTTPS if you have a web server. Right? You should consider secure DNS if you're doing the DNS. And, and those are not law standards so much as um, best practices that might apply to a wide variety of things, but also would be very useful if you are a clerk about to publish a municipal code and looking for specific ideas. If I could jump in here, there, I actually don't think it's a red herring. But I would agree, just focusing on just open sources by itself is not right. It does on, on the other hand, focusing solely on we're going to make a standard is also not right. You need a holistic way of approaching this. Uh, I actually, someone, I gave a presentation on standards years ago, and someone years ago challenged me and said basically, if it's a successful standard, it has an open source implementation. And I said, nah, that, that. Boy, I can't think of any counterexamples. <laughs> I've been thinking for years, and I have still haven't found any very good counterexamples. You can probably find a few niche areas, but in fact, I think these exceptions prove the rule. If there aren't any open source implementations, the problem with specifications, and by the way, I'm part of standards bodies, I'm a big believer. The problem with specifications is that they don't do anything useful. So they sit there unless they are implemented. 
And open source is a wonderful way of getting them out into so people's hands. Just so it's worth, worth, use, worth considering as an approach. I would say that I've got a lot of uh, examples of open source that are okay for verifying functionality <coughs> but might not be very good for scalable production operations. Like lots of cases like that. I, I think there's a whole lot of proprietary software which is exactly <laughs> <the> <laughs> <way>. <laughs> I, I, I so wouldn't say that's out of licensing. I, should, I think you should not um, assume that the existence of an open source implementation necessarily means it is also suitable for production. But uh, you know, that's a new thing. But we have people we have Brian, heard from. Um, so and then I want to make sure that a few people yeah. like Ed Walters and Mike Walsh have a chance to, to comment as well before we run out of time here. Brian, I think the place you to come in. I'm, I'm famous for my equanimity about open source and, and, and high tech Notorious. Notorious, perhaps. But, uh, <laughs> I, I believe it's not a red herring here to the degree that the vision for law.gov is perhaps unlike its title. It's not about a single site, but instead about a, a type of site that every governing body would eventually have. Right. If that is the vision, that is absolutely then, the vision. There will not be a single site producing a law. That then, will never. Then I think open source is actually key, because I and I think it's uh, it's the only enabling way that we allow um, in these jurisdictions to get to that vision at their own pace, at their own technology, uh, and uh, uh, ra rapidly enough. And I think it becomes a platform for. Uh, either the formal or the de facto adoption of standards for the data types that it manages, right? Because you'll bootstrap it with some common things that are all about hoovering the, the, the digital raw data, PDFs, whatever, right? Uh, or I'm sure there's an existing trough style kind of like data formats, whatever, right? You know, put that in. Um, uh, uh, but I haven't heard that before. <laughs> eventually it'll be like, you know, here's the data format for, for uh, uh, court opinions, here's the data format for drafting of new laws. Right? I could even see it growing eventually to become a CMS system for uh, that the that the, the um, senates and the, and the and the governing bodies would use as a as a, pro a part of their process of defining law. Right, of going from raw draft to actually you know voting and such, just like we use the Wikipedia today for this kind of thing. Right, but that's a far off future. <coughs> I, I think again, it's about if if you have many peers who all want to converge on a common platform and eventually talk about standards on top. I think open source is is, is totally uh, key to that. It's something that that uh, is it's hard to otherwise accomplish. Okay, um, Ed, do you have any statements? Uh, anything to say about this? Or I, I don't want to put you on the spot, but uh, no, I actually do have a few thoughts. Okay, about so it. Ed Walters is the CEO of, of Fastcase, which is one one of the, the vendors in, in this space and has some experience with this. <laughs> <laughs> um, well, let me just say so. Um, they say that anecdote is the singular of data. So um, maybe that's an anecdote. <laughs> Illustrative. Um, about 10 years ago, um, I left my law firm here in Washington to start a legal publishing company with the idea that we would take public domain law and make it available for free. Um, the absence of a law.gov in 1999 made that impossible. <coughs> to get the back file, to collect the data from the thousands of sources that it comes from every day is hugely expensive. Um, and so as a result, we made a, a service that I would say has kind of a freemium model. Probably 95% of our users get access to Fastcase for free. 5% uh, of them uh, end up subsidizing the other 95%. So it's, a, it's a, a little bit of a nod to the fact that it's super expensive to collect this information, um, both in the back file and on an ongoing basis. Um, that's not going to be the way it works in the future. I think law.gov is going to be instrumental in making the law on an ongoing basis available to anybody who wants to publish it. In full. So I said, I think that's hugely important. Um, I think Ben really nailed it when he said that we should be focusing more on the standards and less on sort of how we get there. I think there's going to be a lot of different ways that people implement those standards. I think a lot of them are going to be open source. I think that's going to be a a really good way to get people into it. I think there will be probably proprietary standards. I'm sure Ian Alexis will come out with some real proprietary implementations. You you said proprietary standards. I'm sorry, you meant proprietary, proprietary implementations. Exactly. Yeah. yeah, and, and I, proprietary I, standards kind of an oxymoron. Well, yeah, <laughs> but I we, think that there are those. <laughs> that's part of the problem. <laughs> well, yeah. Right. No, but I, I do think that there will be people who put together like you know very nice implementations and very nice solutions for governments to kind of build into these standards. But at the end of the day. You have to make sure that the next fast case is able to take the judicial opinions from all of the courts in all the same format in a way that's purposeful, easy to use, 
simple, there's a lot of power in that. Um, and I think that's really important. I think uh, kind of beyond that, uh, one big question that we need to ask going <coughs> forward is, how do you create the incentives for people to contribute to the system? And here I'm thinking about those municipalities that are you know, gonna have a hard time paying the money, mm -hmm. doing the training, getting the stuff online. Um, I think back in the 90s when my law firm had this bright, shiny KM system that they had rolled out. Um, it was great, they did a bunch of training, spent a lot of money developing it, and uh, nobody ever contributed to it. And so it was just this uh, beautiful tortoise shell. There, there is an, an, a kind of answer to that question specifically, and I believe that uh, people will adopt the use of something if it makes their job easier to do. If it's incremental, if it's another thing they have to do, there's less incentive, but if it actually helps them do what they need to do. And it may also be the case that there are some forcing functions if it is required by some means or other that these laws be available. If, if we have state level requirements or even national level requirements that they all have to be made available in some standard form, then the open source is going to help because of the cost, but it also helps them do the job which is now required of them. So we may have to have some forcing function here, plus the availability of software they can adopt to meet that requirement. I think it's a key part of the equation because just having standards out there, just having open source software doesn't out guarantee there, anyone will adopt. There's a lot of people who right. say, look, I've got enough between nine Correct. and five every day, right. yeah. and I'm leaving at five o'clock. Is it not already true that uh, Organizations that cannot publish, jurisdictions that are not able to publish their legal materials online, uh, that probably belies some set of technology, I don't want to say failures, but uh, it's, their technology situation is probably wanting uh, in the back end, right? And so by cr by creating or inculcating the, the ability to, to, to publish this stuff in a standard way, they, they can actually feed themselves in this way. I, I would well, say, I think it's true in some cases, but let me right. just say, you know, um, the Court of Appeals of Georgia has a paywall. Mm -hmm. They charge for the opinions. Right. How are we going to convince the Court of Appeals in Georgia to contribute to a system like this? Mm -hmm. It's the right thing to do, but you know this they're going to lose some money. This is just like trying to get IEEE and ACM to make their online versions of the journals openly available, at least to the members, without incremental cost. Absolutely, public. absolutely. And, and the one difference between the IEEE and the ACM, of course, is is that you don't have to obey the ACM. <laughs> um, so we're almost out of time. I want to make sure before we close this session that we hear from one person, Mike Wash, who is the Chief Information Officer of the Government Printing Office, and I believe the only person in this room who actually produces um, primary legal materials and makes them available in bulk for people to um, download and does so in an authenticated fashion. So but maybe you can close us out, Mike. Um, yeah, and I apologize for being late. Thank you. Uh, we gossiped about you while you were not. We assigned you a video. We assigned you a ton of work. Really? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. We've just been developing our RFP for you right now. Great. Um, been listening to the last half hour, and uh, I completely agree with the, the comments about standards. Um, I'm also very much a, an outcomes-based type of, of thinker, mm -hmm. and when I think about law.gov and the work that I've uh, been involved with with Carl in our conversation, you know, when I think about the outcome, and we did this with our system at, at GPO, is when you focus on the outcome of, of you know, freely available material and, and being able to, to share and interoperate with information, it, it really drives you toward uh, what would be the standard, what you know, could eventually emerge into a standard, and opens up, I think, doors for solutions that would eventually become open source or open source applications. Um, you know, at GPO, we've, uh, we didn't have the, the luxury of using some of the open source tools early on, they, they just weren't really ready at the time. So we're using Documentum, we're using Oracle databases for some things, and we're using Fast for search and things like that. Um, but the things that we did was, particularly around a lot of the way that we manage our data, has been to make it common and make it normalized. And 
those, you know, whether you call those standards or not, you know, we forced ourselves to do things in a way that we could easily um, drive flexibility, expandability, and extensibility into different types of things. And it's, it's already paid off. Um, and some of our, our packaging concepts for, for information, we also drove ourselves to a uh, self-describing information package, which I think could emerge into an interesting standard because we didn't want to be locked into documental. We didn't want to be locked into anything so that our package could be, if it truly is self-describing, that needs to be proven. But if it, if it truly is self-describing, it could work in a number of different environments in open source tools. I mean, Alfresco, for example, should be able to, to work with our, tool, our, our package and be able to completely recreate all of our access and publishing packages. And, and I will second that, by the way. I, I spent a bit of time looking at the government printing office and, and spent quite a bit of time looking at FDSYS. And I, I'm a skeptic when it comes to large government MIS projects. And I, I convinced myself very firmly that, that I like FDSYS, and I wasn't prepared to like it. Um, <laughs> but, but I liked it because the, the system is architected in a way that one could, in fact, rip out any one of the pieces. And all the hard work went into things like the metadata description and the packaging and the workflow and the provenance. And, and that, to me, um, we've begun pointing to FDSYS as an example of what we mean by law.gov. Um, and in fact, when we do a workshop, um, which John Podesta is hosting on June 15th. There will be an entire session that Andrew McLaughlin is chairing and Mike will be at and the director of the Office of the Federal Register. And that will be an examination of, of not only how to do it right, but when you do it right, the innovation that happens on the outside, we're bringing the GovPulse.us team in to do a demo of what they did with the Federal Register after you released it in XML. Mm -hmm. So and we'll be able to talk about more stuff that they're doing. Absolutely. In fact, there's been a feedback cycle. It's fascinating because not only did the GovPulse team on their own innovate with the Federal Register, the Office of the Federal Register team is beginning to incorporate those innovations into their next cycle of, of publishing the Federal Register. Um, so thank you, everybody, for coming. Um, we're just about out of time here. I know Vic has some um, other obligations, and I actually have some to do at 6 o'clock. This is the beginning, I hope, of a very long, ongoing conversation that began here but I'm hoping that the government will begin having that, that and the government, I mean, is broadly read, uh, will have that conversation much in the same way as, as Brian's shown us and been helping in, in, um, in the healthcare world. Can, so, can I, please, please, yeah, please, one, one a small comment, because uh, uh, looking for ways to facilitate this happening uh, is a real interest. It, I'm not speaking for Google here, I'm just for a sir. There's a guy named Don Horowitz who is a former state Supreme Court judge, uh, justice in the state of Washington. And he has a project which he calls uh, Access to Justice, and he's talking about digital access. Uh, his belief is that in the absence of having digital tools that help you get access to information about the justice system, that there will be people disadvantaged who won't know what the law is or what their options are or anything else. That sort of resonates with what you're trying to accomplish. So uh, offline, I should introduce you to Don. Yes. Maybe there will be some. Well, that's actually the flip side of this. Uh, we just did the Chicago Kent um, Law.gov workshop last week, and Professor Stout, um, who's one of the leading um, uh, experts in this area and is the author of A2J, Access to Justice, um, began to deal in great depth with, with many of those issues. And, and it was a key part of the law.gov story. You know that over 50% of the people that apply to the Legal Services Corporation are turned down because they don't have the resources. Uh, more than 80% of the legal needs of the poor are unmet. Um, a large number of the things in the courts, when you go see a federal judge and you talk to them about filing requirements, they point out to you that the vast majority of their cases do not come from lawyers. They come from pro se representatives. Wow. And, and so that, that's actually a huge issue and it's part of a workflow because if you're going to disseminate your data properly, you got to get it into the system properly. And so that's a huge issue. Okay, so uh, thank you for being the use of uh, Google's Washington, D.C. office. Uh, this is exactly the kind of thing that we always hoped would happen here once we established this. Uh, so please feel free to reschedule another meeting if you wish here. Uh, Carla can help you do that. Okay. All right. Well, Great. Thank, thank you, you very all. much, everybody. I'm going to turn off just like everybody else does.
Let me stop the recording. Okay. Sorry, I don't know. <laughs> <laughs>